Should we start? Sure. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure having Iranian uh, media here around the table. It shows how um, our community is important to our party and to our leader, John Hergan, who would like to work for all, not just for some uh, top 2% well connected probably at the top. And at the same time, we've got the candidate uh, from Tri-Cities and North Vancouver Lonsdale, which we've got uh, most of the Persian communities living in this area. Uh, without wasting the time and saying any more, I leave to John to uh, start and say a few words, and then after that, um, you might start your question. We start with one question uh, <coughs> per each uh, newspaper and TV, and then if we had more time, we go for more question for more um, rounds. Um, John was so far in few events of uh, Persian New Year and um, I guess he's going to be more and more showing up in these um, events and we hope that by passing the message to our community uh, through the media that we have um, you also show how important they are for all of us. Then leave it to John. Well, thank you, Mehdi, and uh, it's a privilege to be here at this time of celebration as we look back at the traditions that uh, the Iranian-Persian community uh, not only have but bring to us here in British Columbia, and we look forward to uh, progress and prosperity in the year ahead. Uh, as Mehdi said, I participated in the Tri-Cities celebration this year, uh, and I have to confess that the fires are smaller in Coquitlam than they are here in the North Shore. And my first Nehru's uh, celebration, I think, was three years ago when I first became leader. And uh, I famously, uh, I was petrified of fire. I have to tell an anecdote. When I was a young boy, I was roasting a marshmallow and it caught fire and I pulled it up to blow it out and it stuck on my forehead. So ever since then, I've been afraid of fire. But when I jumped at Ambleside over the over the fire of renewal, I felt uh, that I had shed finally after all these years this fear of, uh, of fire. And again, to be with Jody Wickens and Selena Robinson and Rick Glumack in Coquitlam in the Tri-Cities area where there was a large Iranian population, it was a great celebration. And the rain did not wet the uh, appetite for celebration that, that day. And to be with Bowen and Mehdi here on the North Shore, I believe, is uh, very exciting for me as the leader of the official opposition. And now that the legislature has risen, effective, I think, noon today. We are officially on to the campaign trail. And to have a candidate uh, of Mehdi's caliber and of Bowen's caliber running here on the North Shore is very exciting for my party and very exciting for me personally. Uh, to have a representative from the Iranian community on our slate allows us to speak directly to the community, and not just in language, but in understanding of the traditions and expectations the community has for government. Uh, this is exciting for me. I tried very hard to, um, in my time as leader, to have a reflective group of people running as candidates. Uh, Bowen is a, a Canadian of Chinese descent. Uh, we have a number of Chinese Canadian candidates. We have a number of South Asian candidates, uh, Filipino candidates, First Nations candidates, uh, Caucasian candidates, uh, gay, lesbian, transgender candidate in Vancouver Falls Creek. Uh, I believe uh, our institutions should reflect the communities that we live in. And I'm very proud to have uh, Mehdi on our team and Bowen as well. And, and also our two elected MLAs with us today and Rick as a city councillor in Port Moody. These are, people are here today because they will be running in communities that have vibrant and dynamic Iranian populations. And, and for that, I'm grateful. And I think uh, I'll open it up to questions. But before I get to that point, I want to say that as we go into the coming election campaign, as Mehdi outlined, our party will be running on the values and issues that people bring to us. And as an opposition member for now 12 years, I've been hearing over and over again that they don't, people don't feel they have a government that's working for them. We have a government that's focused on the people that are writing them checks rather than the people that need services, people that need uh, the attention of government to make sure that their families can, can thrive and prosper here in British Columbia. So that's our goal, that's our objective, and in 54 days, uh, with the, the wind at our back and, and luck at hand as an Irish person, tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, so uh, I'm feeling very positive about the future, and I'm hopeful that uh, we will be able to, to have uh, Rick and, and Mehdi and Bowen join us in the legislature, Jody and, and Selena and I, on May 10th.
So with that, I invite any questions you may have, and I'm sure my colleagues will have something to say as well. Let us start with the ladies. My question is um, about the MSP, mm -hmm. and uh, we all know that just recently uh, Christy Clark decided to uh, reduce it uh, for people with, uh, uh, I guess, $120,000 overall uh, income. Uh, and then they, uh, it's been said that uh, they are going to just eliminate it soon, probably. Soon, probably, so maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So basically, question is that uh, now your plan, uh, how different your plan is going to be uh, for MSP yeah. now with this new uh, announcement? Okay, lots of questions there. Uh, firstly, I want to start by saying that the BC Liberals doubled medical services premiums over the past number of years. So they've just come recently to the notion that they should be done away with. And even then, they're not going to do it right away. They're going to do it next year, maybe. We'll see. And I think it's important to remember that New Democrats have been talking about medical services premiums as being unfair for years now. And the government continued to defend the practice of taking the same amount of money in premiums from someone making $40,000 a year as someone making $400,000 a year. So it was a flat tax that affected everybody the same regardless of your family or your personal income. That's just not fair. And it's counter to the values, I think, as Canadians that we have that our tax system should be progressive with those who have the least paying the least and those who have the most paying the most with uh, credits and benefits and so on along the way. Our tax system has become complicated over time. But one thing I do know is that every other province in the country administers health services without a medical services premium. BC is the only one that has this flat tax. So when we raised the issue, the government's response was, well, we need to have that uh, premium in there so people are reminded that health care costs something. And now they've changed their view and they're going to eliminate it over time, maybe sometime next year. Our plan will lay out in the weeks ahead will be to eliminate MSP premiums over the term of our first four years of government. And we're going to do that by making sure that those that can least afford to pay now are the ones that we address right away. The Premier set a target. Government is always about choices. And she's made her choices and she's laid them out. And she's using the full power of government to sell that plan to citizens. Uh, they are spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million of taxpayers' money advertising and promoting themselves and this epiphany they've had, this change they've had in their view about medical services premiums. We're going to lay out our plan in the coming days that we'll uh, be able to be put beside what the Liberals are proposing and, and the people will have their opportunity to make that decision. But I know that over the past three years the government has raised more from medical services premiums than they have from forestry mining and natural gas combined. It's a flat tax, it's an unfair tax, and it doesn't go to delivering health services, it goes into general revenue. So to the question of how do we deliver better services, that too is about choices. We need to make sure that we're not just hiring lots and lots of executives to run and administer our health authorities, but we're hiring frontline workers to deliver services to people. And those are choices that governments can and should make. The Liberals have been making choices that interest and benefit those that deliver uh, the administrative services rather than those that deliver the health services. Well, if you allow the next person and then we turn around the table, yes. And by all means, feel free anyone to pile in if you... Yes, please. In 16 years, the BC government increased uh, tuition revenues nearly 400 percent. That is causing a lot of stress to the graduates and consequently to the families. What do you have in your agenda in regards to this issue? Very good question. And, and those numbers are staggering. And when you think that until just recently, when uh, the government has been giving loans to students to meet these high costs of tuition and books and cost of living and accommodation and so on, they've been uh, asking for 3 and 4 percent above the borrowing rate in return for those loans. The government has now changed that to just a 1% increase above the, the borrowing rate, but still that's taking money away from students who don't have it to cover the cost of borrowing the money that is done by government each and every day. So they call it an administrative fee, but in fact it's a premium that they're taking from vulnerable people and again putting it in to general revenue choices that the government makes. 
they've also um, made choices about increasing tuition fees and they've also made choices about inviting uh, foreign students to come and fill those spaces. I have no issue with inviting uh, foreign students to come to Canada. I myself was a foreign student in Australia and I benefited greatly from that. But they're selling seats to foreign students at a premium price and not making those seats available to domestic students in some cases. And that's wrong. I want to see a diversity of students in our uh, post-secondary institutions. I think that's a positive thing. But at, if it's at the expense of domestic students or, or the seats are priced to a level that uh, local folks can't get in, we have a problem on our hand. So we will, again, I apologize that uh, the legislature just rose today. Our platform will be delivered in the weeks ahead, but there will be some very exciting things when it comes to post-secondary education around uh, graduate students and making sure that uh, we are keeping our, our graduate students here rather than having them go to other jurisdictions. Uh, we're going to give incentives for that. We're going to give incentives for completing degrees uh, rather than getting started and then becoming uh, so burdened with debt or, or having the tuition so out of reach for individuals that they have to give up their, their education. We're going to have incentives to complete as well. But I, I think you'll be pleased with what you have, we have to say. We're also going to allow uh, UBC, SFU, University of Victoria, BCIT to build student housing to borrow the money themselves to build the housing because that also creates uh, more housing stock in the community for regular people. As it is now, uh, UBC just completed a residence. They had to get approval from the government before they did it. They have an ability to borrow on the market at the government rate, build that housing, recoup those costs over time through rents and, and costs of student housing, and it frees up space in the domestic housing market for other people who are struggling to find those homes. This is something the government said they were going to do eight years ago, and they still haven't done it. Yes, please. Uh, hello, this is Ramin from Aria TV Vancouver. Uh, you are a leader of Critic Party to the current government in BC. Yes. So I'm so interested to uh, uh, listen to the, uh, your highlight, how you highlight your the, the current issues in BC at the provincial level and uh, what uh, will be your let's say plans the highlights to mm -hmm. fix them <coughs> just a brief well we, there's three I'll, I'll give you three general areas first and foremost we want to make sure that the economy continues to grow we're creating jobs but that everyone's benefiting from that economy not just those at the top as Mehdi said uh, only the the very wealthy are benefiting from uh, much of the economic activity that's going on in British Columbia in rural BC for example where we depend on our resource economy we're seeing fewer and fewer jobs 30,000 fewer people are working in forestry today than we're working in 2001 we've seen uh, almost 150 oh, actually over 150 mills close in rural communities which means jobs are being lost there uh, the, the communities are shrinking, not growing, and people are migrating to our urban centers looking for economic opportunity. And some people are, are trying to uh, get by with two and three jobs when the Premier is doing one job and getting two salaries. She gets her salary as Premier and then a top-up for her fundraising activities for the BC Liberals. That top-up is higher than the average salary of most British Columbians. So the economy needs to be working for everybody, and we're going to be focusing on that. Growing the economy, investing in public services, infrastructure leads to jobs. We have 7,000 kids in portable classrooms in Surrey. We can change that by building new schools. That creates jobs uh, in the construction industry, which has spin-offs for small businesses who are providing services to those companies. So a public investment plan, an infrastructure plan, <coughs> will create more economic activity, and that's a good thing. On the delivery of services, we've seen the government reducing services and I've got Selena here who's our senior spokesperson who might want to talk about seniors care which is a, a, an absolute tragedy in British Columbia. Nine out of ten publicly funded senior care facilities don't have the human resources to deliver the services that are minimally required by uh, BC regulation. So maybe you want to dive in on that because that's sure. an area of service delivery on health care and on seniors that are it, is it, particularly acute. So part of what we see is uh, people in residential care not getting a bath frequently. So sometimes it could be 10 or 12 days before they get a bath. Or if they um, aren't very mobile, they wind up sitting in one room for a very long time. Even though they want to move, there's no staff around to help them get to wherever it is they want to go. And uh, the staff are burning out as well. They're feeling tremendous pressure to get through the tasks. And they feel like they can't care for people because everything is about tasks in the residential care setting. 
We also have seniors who are staying at home um, longer. We all agree, I think, that keeping seniors at home as long as possible is the better model. But they also sometimes need home support. And again, we see where home support isn't properly supported by this government. And so what does that mean? It means that seniors are put to bed at 6 p.m. because there's not someone to come by at 9 or 10 to put them to bed. It means that seniors, when they are feeling really uh, vulnerable or scared, their care provider who comes in for 10 or 15 minutes to give them their pills and to help them with a the meal doesn't have time to sit with them and hold their hand and have a cup of tea. And so they, because they have to be rushed to go to the next, the next person. So we treat, they're, we're treating seniors like they're um, an assembly line rather than people to be cared for. And these are the kinds of things we've been seeing as this government um, decides to make other kinds of choices, like uh, increasing their budget to advertise how great they are, rather than putting that into seniors' care. And it's time for a new government, and with John Horgan as the uh, premier, we'll certainly be able to uh, do the right thing and make care for seniors a priority. The other area of service delivery that's been very lacking over the past number of years is public education. Uh, Jody is our deputy critic for public education, so she'll speak a bit about that. I just want to lay out the fact that uh, the Liberals picked a fight with uh, the BC Teachers Federation in 2002. They stripped contracts of language around class size and class composition, which led to poor student outcomes. They fought for 13 years until the Supreme Court finally said the government was wrong. Now the question to the public is, who do you trust to implement that Supreme Court decision and adequately support public education? The people that have been fighting uh, the education system and trustees and teachers and parents for the past number of years or an opposition that wants to be a government and support that and Jody's been working on that area. So um, like John said, we've, the, the, the government has now been forced to go back to 2002 levels for class size and composition. <coughs> And what we've seen over the 16 years that the BC Liberal government has been in power is we've gone from the best uh, per pupil funded system in the country to the second worst pu per pupil funded system in the country. And that has had a drastic effect on what our, our children are getting for a public education. We have great teachers and we have uh, great families in the province of British Columbia, but it's a system that is very much stressed right now. And so in my community, in the legislature, we have parents coming all of the time talking about the fact that they can't get the services for their children that their children need, particularly if they have a child that has extra learning needs, special needs, things like that. And so right now what we're seeing is we're going to see a bit of a crisis and chaos that this government has created. Now they have to go back to 2002 levels. We don't have the space in schools that are required, so I've had moms come and say that they can't get their child into their local kindergarten class because that class is over capacity and they have to travel worried about quitting their jobs. Uh, we don't have enough teachers to fill the positions that we're going to need. There's been no planning by this government and no investment in public education and that has a consequence both short term and long term. And so right now what we need is a government that will actually prioritize public education. A government that will actually look at our young children and say they are our future. And there's no greater economic investment that you can make than in our children and in their education. It will create a better, more just society. And I know that John has spoken in depth all of the time about how much public education means to him. And I am a public education advocate. I have two small children and it means so much to me that we invest in our public education services and I believe that with John Horgan as our premier that will happen in the province. So, how so the children with a special need, such as autism, <coughs> more resources in the classroom. Uh, if you're able to uh, diagnose or, or uh, identify children with needs early on in their education, the likelihood of success is far greater. Uh, and early intervention with autism, and, and Jody has a good deal of experience in this regard, early intervention with young children leads to better outcomes as well. If you're not putting the resources there to identify and, and to, in, to identify what the issue is, you're not able to prescribe the right outcome down the road. 
So, so we. Sorry, Mandy, you want to? No, I just would like to. So, I just just to wrap up on the yeah. third point, okay. we've got growing the economy for everybody, providing services for people, health, education, and so on. And then the last critical point that we're going to be campaigning on is affordability, because we're being crushed here in British Columbia with increased costs. We talked about MSP, hydro rates have been going up year after year after year. They're going up again, another three and a half percent, April first. Uh, salaries have not been going up three and a half percent over the past number of years, and yet hydro has been going up annually. ICBC rates are forecast under the current government's plan to go up 40 percent in the next three years. That's not sustainable. So we're going to be talking about affordability, the cost of housing here in the Metro Vancouver area, critically important. But these fees that have been p put on people by government. ICBC, BC Hydro, MSP, those are things that governments can control and this government's been making choices to rot, put them up to unsustainable levels. We have to get that under control. Thank you. And that's the long answer. Go ahead. Thank you. And the next media, please. Uh, as a Premier, how would you um, act upon the demand of, in my opinion, the majority of Iranian Canadian community mm -hmm. to re-establish full diplomatic relations, first of all, and have more integration in terms of cultural exchanges, people-to-people -people exchanges, in terms of education, uh, trade and investment. Thank you. Um, and again, acknowledging that that's beyond my purview as uh, leader of the opposition, certainly, and, and even as premier. But it, to that end, uh, why I'm so excited to have Mehdi as a candidate, why I'm grateful to be here again with many of you talking about issues that are relevant to the Persian-Iranian community, having participated in celebratory events, uh, been able to better understand the dynamism and the, and the diversity of the Iranian community. That's helped me uh, grow as a politician and to better understand the needs of the community. And should I be elected Premier on May 10th, I'll be working on May 9th, on May 10th, I'll be working with Mehdi and others to try and better understand how I can, as leader of a government, realize uh, the dreams and aspirations of the Iranian community here in British Columbia, first and foremost. And included in that, of course, would be ensuring that links and ties back to the home country are as strong as they can possibly be. But I'll be, I'll be very much open to taking counsel on that question, and it'll be as diverse as I can possibly make it. I, I really do feel strongly about this. I'm the son of an immigrant myself. My father came from Ireland for a better life for himself. I'm passionate about Ireland, even though it's not, uh, I have an Irish passport as a result, and I, and I speak fondly, and tomorrow I will be relishing in that heritage. I think it's critically important that British Columbians, wherever they came from, are able to celebrate and feel connected to their home. Chinese Canadians, uh, Iranian Canadians, First Nations being able to, to talk and speak proudly and to celebrate and, and utilize their traditions here in BC is what makes us such a vibrant and dynamic place. I'm proud of that. I'm excited about that. And as leader of a government, I'll be doing what I can to make sure that I'm opening up as many doors as possible rather than closing them. And Mr. Darish. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for your time. Um, according to The Economist, Vancouver is the most expensive city in North America. But the minimum wage is still one of the lowest in Canada. And what is your plan about that and what are you going to do in general for the working class? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I agree that uh, affordability is a fundamental issue. As I say, it's one of the three issues we're going to be focusing on, the economy, services, and affordability. And here in the Lower Mainland particularly, it's becoming increasingly a place for the rich and the wealthy rather than a place for regular people to put down roots, to uh, start businesses, to, to grow and create and prosper. And, and we need to change that. And, and that doesn't mean we stifle the existing growth. It means we try and make sure that everyone's benefiting from it. And one way you do that is by increasing the minimum wage to a level that's reasonable. Uh, Alberta's done it, uh, Seattle has done it. So within our economic zone, other jurisdictions have increased to $15 an hour, and we intend to do that as well. It's part of our platform to make the minimum wage $15 an hour, not overnight, over time. Uh, but I believe that if you have disposable income and you're a low-income citizen, you usually spend that money. Rare is the individual that will take away their few extra dollars and put them in a tax haven somewhere else. They usually spend them in the local community, those dollars, and that stimulates more economic activity as well. There's study after study that confirms if you give low-income <coughs> citizens 
more dollars, they'll spend them locally. That'll create more activity. Uh, I talked about a, one thing today as a former waiter who depended on gratuities and tips, uh, that the notion that in British Columbia we have a serving wage and we have a minimum wage. And the serving wage is below the minimum wage because there's an expectation by the Liberals that patrons will subsidize the wages of those who are serving them drinks or food and so on. I, I just reject that. I don't reject gratuities and tips. I think that that should be part and parcel of the experience of dining out or going out on an evening. But it should not be there to subsidize the low wages being paid by those, those places. Now, if the cost of a meal has to go up a buck or two, uh, to pay those uh, wages, and I think that the economy should be able to sustain that. And the notion that somehow uh, paying the least paid workers in the community will lead to economic devastation has not been proven in any other jurisdiction. I don't know why it would be proven here. Thank you. My name is Kate Wadis I'm from Civic Association of Iranian Canadian. Mm, I think uh, the role of government is say who should pay tax and how much and who should get the service. This is easy. That's very succinct. That's very <laughs> true. Yeah. I want to know uh, by delivering more services uh, at this uh, economic condition, uh, what would be changed? Uh, what would change to the bracket tax? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, if you look at the uh, provincial uh, healthcare budget, it's about I think it's about uh, forty percent of the whole budget, yeah. and if you are going to uh, okay, more services, uh, where does it come and how the change would came to the tax work? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, uh, growing the economy by investing in public infrastructure leads to more likelihood of private sector investment. And, and I'll give you an example of uh, a Soyuz in the interior. Uh, the school board was forced to make a decision to close the high school there because the provincial government, the BC Liberals, were not moving enough resources to keep the school open. They had a criteria of so many students, a, a capacity of 90 percent, a capacity, and if you couldn't reach that, then the school was, uh, was in, in excess, you should close it down, and those kids should move to the next closest school. Fair enough, uh, but if you close a high school in a community, what's the likelihood of you being able to attract investors? What's the likelihood of you being able to attract professionals to come? Uh, Bowen's an engineer. What would, why would Bowen go uh, to work in a community that doesn't have a high school or, or doesn't have health care services or doesn't have adequate transportation infrastructure? So when government, uh, to add to the collecting of wealth and the delivering of services, those are two key elements, but there's also preparing the groundwork of the physical infrastructure so those two things can happen. You can deliver services and you can generate wealth. And I believe the Liberals have been making the wrong choices in that regard as well. Here in the Lower Mainland, to bring it back home, we need transportation and transit improvements, not just to keep the economy going, but to meet our climate change objectives, which we have signed on to internationally, and we have an obligation to meet not just for ourselves, but most importantly, for our children and our grandchildren. And the BC Liberals chose to have a divisive referendum on something that governments are supposed to lead on. And so for four years, we've seen no meaningful improvement in transit and transportation infrastructure because the government put it to the public to say, are you prepared to increase, I believe it was the gas tax by, or no, the sales, uh, tax. The, the sales tax by half a point. And rare is the day, as we learn from the United States, that if people are given the opportunity to vote in favor of taxes, they usually don't. Mm -hmm. And so it was destined to fail. Governments should make decisions based on need, based on leadership, and if the public is unhappy with that, the good news is that we have elections every four years and you can throw them out. So I would prefer government that leads by example and says at the beginning what they want to do. And we're going to be talking about, for example, what is our infrastructure plan and what are we going to build to help the economy grow. And when it comes to taxation broadly, I can give you one example that I've already talked about without giving out our platform today, the only tax cut that the BC Liberals have given since 2013 was to individual incomes above $150,000 a year. That tax break for the top 2% of wage earners, not family income, individual income, has cost you and I $250 million a year. And to recoup that cost, the Liberals have increased medical services premiums every single year until this year. And they've increased every single year to recoup that lost revenue. Over a four-year period, that's $1 billion that we, 
have given in it medical services premiums so that the top 2% can get a tax break. That's a choice that the Liberals made. It's not a choice that I would make. And I've made it abundantly clear that I'm going to reverse that high income uh, uh, tax concession and put that bracket back to where it was before the 2013 election. There'll be other measures that we'll talk about, about how we're going to grow the economy, how we're going to make sure that everybody benefits from the dynamism of the lower mainland particularly, but the entire economy uh, in the weeks ahead. But, I, but I'll tell you off the bat that we're going to, A, we're going to do away with medical services premiums over time, and B, uh, those millionaires out there that have been getting a break, I'm sorry, I'm not your best day. Uh, if you want, you want to keep getting your break, vote for her. If you want fairness, vote for me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know how it would be the schedule, but if there is any other question, we can go for the second round. If not, we can have a closing. Yes, please, sir. Okay. Uh, again, Rami from Aria TV. Actually. Uh, uh, it's good to introduce your uh, new uh, candidates who are running for the to be elected as a uh, uh, sure. member of parliament. Yeah, please. Well, I'm happy to do that. Uh, on, on my left is Bowen Ma, who's been going to be running for in here in North Vancouver Lonsdale. Bowen is a great candidate. We met what a year and a half ago, Somewhere around there. Yeah, and yeah. we talked about how Bowen could fit into an NDP plan. Uh, she told me about her excitement to, to participate in public service, but she can probably tell you that herself right now. But I'm very happy to have her on the team. So Bowen, have at it. Absolutely. My name is Bowen Ma. You can see my, my big old banner over there. This is our central campaign office here in the heart of North Vancouver Lonsdale. Uh, I am a professional engineer. Uh, my background is in civil engineering. I have a master's in management from the Sauter School of Business, and I normally manage terminal expansion and redevelopment projects out at YBR, but I do live out here in North Vancouver. And it is such a wonderful, wonderful place as well, in part because of the Iranian community that is out here. I see every day the way that the Iranian community uh, contributes its, generously contributes its culture and its uh, experience, its style and its amazing, fantastic Nowruz events. And North Vancouver is a far more vibrant and dynamic place as a result of that, and I thank you. Yeah. And uh, Mehdi Russell will be running in uh, West Vancouver Capilano, and uh, he also can speak for himself, but I am extremely excited to have uh, 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 candidates of this caliber running here on the North Shore, and Mehdi, please uh, oh, Thank you. Well, yourself. as you know, I got a medical profession background, and soon after I finished my medicines, I started working with vulnerable people, helping the, um, n in fact, the homeless and drug abusers uh, back home and been uh, done a lot to help them with their health coverage and as a result followed up uh, my higher education in UK in public health and joined the international organization helping people in disaster like Indonesia, like um, Pakistan, even in Iran after the BAM earthquake I've been involved. Then all my life been involved with the society and with the community that I live with and caring about vulnerable people in general. For the last 10 years, mostly on pharmaceutical and business part of the medical devices, uh, establishing a factory for anti-cancer production for the first time in Middle East. That was one of the projects that I could finish. And here consulting companies for international uh, market. Then bringing all my um, background in community-based activities and the business part of uh, my experiences to the community that I'm living with and I hope that I can help uh, people around me here in this community with more affordable life including my daughters who are living in this uh, beautiful part of the Vancouver which is North Shore. And Rick Glumack is our candidate in Port Coquitlam, or Port Moody, Coquitlam, and uh, he's a city councillor. He also is in the information technology sector, a, a fast-growing and dynamic part of our economy here in the Lower Mainland and right across BC. Very excited to have him on the team as well. Rick? Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've been a city councillor in Port Moody for five years. I, I come from a uh, different uh, high-tech background, uh, computer animation. I worked on Shrek 2 in Madagascar. Uh, and a few other animated films and uh, I worked in uh, video games as well at Electronic Arts and, uh, and now working in mobile app development and um, there's a huge potential in this province I think for high-tech expansion and with every high-tech job there's like five other jobs that come out of that and I'm so excited to be part of a diverse team of people you can see 
the, the diversity of experience up here that represents I think the NDP and and we want to represent the people in this province and all the diverse points of view and I'm very excited to be part of that and um, Jody and, and Selena have already been elected. They've got bios on the website. You can check them out. <laughs> but, uh, but again, uh, just to echo what Rick said, I am so pleased to have these three new candidates. And Jody had joined us in a by-election. Uh, Selena and I were elected together in 2013 in the general election. Uh, but Jody came in in a by-election. And with her was a woman named Melanie Mark, who was the first First Nations woman to take a seat in the BC legislature. Again, fulfilling for me one of the objectives I set out to ensure that we were as diverse as possible in, in our representation. If we can do that in our legislature, that will start to percolate through our public institutions or into our business institutions. More women uh, being involved. Uh, Selena is a champion within our caucus uh, on women's issues. Jody's formally responsible for women's issues, but 43% of the group that we've currently elected are women. And we want to get that to 50%. Uh, Bowen is going to be uh, contributing to that. And, and so our, our objective is to be the community that we represent. And, and to have uh, the individuals that are flanking me here today, I think it's abundantly clear, as Rick says, that we've got a young, dynamic, and diverse team that's ready, ready to take on the, the responsibilities uh, of governing British Columbia. And we're going to do it in a way that's compassionate, that's focused, and it's going to be focused exclusively on making sure people's lives are better. And I don't think we've been getting that for the past number of years. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. And there's a cinnamon bun over there with my name. Now they know about that. Oh, the Rosa Town Rose. That's what it is. Well, thank you all for coming out today. We're so grateful to have you out here on short notice. Yeah. Uh, as you've heard today, the Iranian community is one of the most important elements of the North Shore and the Tri Cities, and you know that. We know that. We look forward to to working building together. to absolutely to working together to build a better BC. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.